am super excited on today. I know I say this with every episode, but I am really excited on today because you are literally watching Live Her True make history on today. First off, we are here shooting live at FinCon 2019, and I'm super excited about it because this is my very first FinCon. And so obviously this is our first time shooting Live Her True here at FinCon. Also, we are making history because this is my first panel! <laughs> this is my first panel discussion and I'm super excited about it. And you guys, just in case you are watching this by video, do not adjust your screens because yes, we have a, a man in the conversation on today. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, we are making history today. I know this is usually our safe place for us women to come together and talk about self-awareness, but we can learn some things from our brothers as well, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to learn a little something from Brian on today because we can learn from him just as much as he can learn from us. So just in case you are not familiar with FinCon, let me just sum it up for you in a few words. FinCon is where money meets media. It's pretty much what they say. Money nerds come together to talk all things finance. And I know you're looking like, okay, Lakeisha, you don't talk about finances. You're all about self-awareness. Yes, I know. So I am here to disrupt the conversation by talking about self-awareness and mindset because both are very crucial when it comes to our finances because we want to change purpose, not money, because that's where the fulfillment is. Purpose, not money. So on today, I have some money nerds with me, and we're going to talk about how self-awareness actually affects our relationship with money. And so, you guys, thank you so much for saying yes to having this conversation with me on today. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Couldn't resist. Oh, thank you. So, I like to start off with every episode just talking about how I've come to meet my guests on the show. And so, where our story is going to be pretty simple which was I went into the FinCon app, I put up a post that said, hey, I'm coming to FinCon, I'm going to talk about self-awareness, how it affects finances, are you down with a conversation? And these beautiful people say yes. <laughs> so now we are here and I'm super excited. So if you guys don't mind, please just tell us who you are and just a little bit of what it is that you do. And Brian, since yep. you were my first male guest, we're going to start yeah, I, with you. I feel very honored. It's very exciting. <laughs> Uh, my name is Brian Vance. I'm from the Detroit area, and I've got a personal finance blog called Bucks and Cents, and it's a general, general personal finance for your life, um, and we talk a little bit on there about uh, mindset and uh, ways to save money and how to get ahead in life. Hi, I'm Hernande Altima. I am from the Maryland, from Maryland, so I'm really, really close to the FinCon um, that's happening right here in D.C. Um, my blog is First Gen Rise, and so I'm a practicing attorney who works in the sphere of mental health. And so what I realized is that, you know, with me being a new attorney and recognizing that there's just this different wave of money that comes my way, um, I just want to use my platform to let people know how they can use money and how they can um, definitely elevate their new status as being a first generation American. I love that. And I uh, blog at freetopersue.com. I'm sorry. <laughs> I used to be anonymous, so I start with free to pursue. Oh, My name okay. is Elan Masigas, and I blog at freetopursue.com and also have a YouTube channel called Free to Pursue. And I talk a lot about money, but I also talk a lot about behavioral psychology around the topics of money. So, and, and a lot, money has a lot to do with personal freedom on a lot of levels. And so, yeah, I think that's value to the conversation. Oh yeah, it's definitely value to the conversation. And on your blogs, I did check it out, you talk a lot about living on your own terms, right? And a lot of people think that money is the way to do just that, right? But I think that we need to shift our mindset when it comes to, to money and start viewing it as a tool, as far as instead of a source of our happiness. Can you give us a, a, a tip on how someone can help us do that? Money is really bad as a source of happiness. Yes. It doesn't really work in and of itself. So what you want to take a look at is how you can use money to your advantage. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a book reviewer, so I'm going to offer a couple of books that really transform awesome. my view on how we handle our relationship with money. One of them is Happy Money. 
there are two editions of that book. There's a Canadian edition and a U.S. edition. So you take a look at the one that makes the most sense for you. And it talks about return on investment, but not return on investment in the traditional way of thinking about money and investments. It's return on investment being happiness. So it talks about where you want to put your money to get the biggest value, happiness value, bang for your buck. And if I can distill the book in very, very quick terms, if you spend it on the American dream, you will be miserable. Because the big house, the, the new car, is about the worst places where you can sink the most money. They do not return. It's experiences that are the biggest bang for your buck when it comes to happiness. Sharing with other people, experiencing some things you've never done. So that's one book. And the other book for self-awareness, which is probably the biggest one for you, is the book Scarcity. And Scarcity is fantastic. It talks about when you have a lack of something in your life, it is constantly on your mind. So if you have a lack of money, it affects your work, it affects your relationships, it affects your ability to be at your full potential. So that's another book. If, if that is something, if you are lacking something, it could be love, it could be money, it could be status, it could be any of those things. It can be so preoccupying that it makes you a lesser version of yourself. So those would be my two recommendations. You know, I love those recommendations. And hopefully they're on Audible. Do you know if they're on Audible? Because I'm an Audible fan. I do believe they both are on Audible. Okay, uh, right. And you can find, if you want a summary, those two book are, are, books are reviewed on my site. So you can get okay. the polls notes of them if you want. Okay, awesome. Yeah. I love the fact that you recommended those particular books because I think a lot of us don't know who we are in the beginning. So that's why we are spending our money on the American dream, the big house, the, you know, the fancy car, because we're literally trying to fill a void, right? And we're not getting to the root of why we have that void. And that takes up a lot. And I think the main reason why is because there's some type of traumatic experience tied to that void that we are literally ignoring. And I understand why, because, you know, who wants to revisit something that's super painful? But in order to really, you know, pursue happiness, you have to do just that. You know, it's funny that you bring up scarcity as well, because my first European vacation that I went on, you know, I wanted to pay for it in cash, but I put it in all credit cards. So I had to literally take a really good look at my finances. And what I found was that I was spending a lot of money on shoes. Because that's what we do as women, right? <laughs> like, I'm talking about buying like 10 pairs per paycheck, okay? Like, yeah, it was bad. And so I had to really dig deep and say, like, where am I buying all these shoes? And it's because growing up in the projects, my mom lived on welfare. She had six, six kids in the household. I didn't get new shoes every school, every school year. So once I was out and working, you could stop me from buying shoes. So then I had to tell myself, okay, what's more important? Is it the experience of this European vacation or getting these shoes, you know? And so I chose the vacation and started taking the money that I was spending on shoes and putting it to the side to pay off my European vacation. And, you know, I still love shoes and I still have a lot of shoes, but it's no, I'm nowhere, you know, where I used to be to spend a lot Shoes. And it was because I was able to really just get to the root of that problem. Like, why do I have a scarcity mindset? And it was because uh, of my background. Yeah. So, um, Brian, I think, you know, one of the many missing pieces that people often miss when it comes to finances is that, you know, getting our finances in order, sometimes we need to look at the non-monetary areas yeah. of our life, right? Like relationships, yeah. community, upbringing, things like that, right? So can you give us one tip on how to get our finances in order that has nothing to do with saving, budgeting, retirement, credit scores, or anything of that nature? I think uh, a lot of that probably comes down to goal setting. Yeah. And, and having like yeah. short and long term goals and uh, really taking a hard look at your life and, and prioritizing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, once you're able to do that, you know, that's sort of your roadmap I think to, to, to get your finances in order to take a look at those things that uh, you know will, will fall into place down the road. But yeah, I would say goal setting. Yeah. I love that. Um, and goal setting is something that's super important because it drives every area of your life. And yep. once again it takes self awareness to know what your goals are. Mm -hmm. 
you know, Hernandez, me, you, we have something in common. We're both first generation college graduates. College, college graduates. And you know, my goal was to become an attorney for a long, long time. Right? I always wanted to be Perry Mason. You guys say Perry Mason? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't be <we> all. <laughs> I always wanted to be Perry Mason, and I was well on my way to do that because I was accepted into Third and Marshall School of Law. That's why I moved to Houston, Texas in the first place. But after my first year, I decided not to go back, right? Because my first year of law school, I felt like I could check the box and feel like, okay, I've done this, so what's next, right? And I couldn't understand why I felt that way because as long as I can remember, I always wanted to be Perry Mason, and right, I'm right there, you know, right there at the mark. Why? You know, am I losing this fire and desire? And it was because that I realized that I just wanted to be Perry Mason to make my mom proud, to make my mom love me, you know, a little bit more. So I was truly chasing a dream that belonged to me, right? And so and that's a little bit of your story being a first generation um, college graduate. So did that influence, you know, your career path? So the, what you're talking about is the burden of, you know, wanting to be, you know, yes. to appeal to your family and make Absolutely. them proud and definitely wanting to make sure that you carry the name in, a, in this beautiful light. Absolutely. And as being the first in my family to do that, um, so I, I am a practicing attorney and um, and it was tough, but I originally was pre-med, <laughs> but I, I switched over to becoming a lawyer because I recognized the voice of you know, or the role or the value of being a lawyer and elevating the voices of people that were vulnerable. Um, and so for me, you know, when I graduated um, college, um, I really didn't know at the core what I was going to do since I was, my whole entire college career was about medicine. Mm -hmm. So I had to shift and then I went to grad school that helped me refocus what I valued most about being a biology student, which was really fine-tuning, getting down to the details and everything of that nature. And so, but it, but it goes back to what you're saying and, and really, you know, doing a little inventory of where everything is coming from and how um, you are reaching the next decision and the next idea. And so I think every person in their family should really think that because we want to make our family proud. We want to make our parents proud, especially since they sacrifice so much. You want to, you know, pay a debt that you have no way of paying at all. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I decided not to go back to law school, like I literally had to tell people where I wasn't mm -hmm. going. It wasn't just my mom. Mm -hmm. It was other, you know, family members. It was my like community. I joke with people all the time, even though it's kind of true, but I joke all the time that I had my claim list by the time I was in the seventh grade. <laughs> that's how <laughs> that's how much people believed in right. believed in me and believed that I was gonna be an attorney. So for me not to walk down that path, it really like it really affected me a little bit, but I had to advocate for myself and say that, you know, I need to find who I am, right? And if law school is not it, let me take a moment to discover the picture, like what she really wants, you know? Because a lot of us, we're just not doing that. We are literally the walking dead. We walking around just mindlessly, robotically, just doing things, you know, out of habit and routine, yeah. and that's it. And I know you talk a lot about that on your blog, and I love it, right? I love that term, the walking dead. Can you explain it to us a little bit more and give us one tip that we can know if we're the walking dead and how we can resuscitate ourselves? Okay, I'll give you an example. <laughs> okay. So, I had just accepted my job, my first job, out of the MBA program I finished to go work for a telecom. Mm -hmm. And the picture that's my first day, it is etched in my mind. I get to the elevator and there is this man who is ashen. And he is kind of a little bit curved over. He's got, yeah, he's got his briefcase and he's pressing that elevator button. And I thought, this guy is counting the number of days he still has to work for retirement. And I said to myself, if I ever show up to work, and that is how I am feeling, I need to leave. And I called him before the show, before the TV show existed, <laughs> I called him a member of The Walking Dead, because that's what it was. He looked like death warmed up. And so, yeah, and so when I ended up in a situation where I felt like I was heading that way, I was broken in a certain way, 
if I had options, I could walk away and be fine because I've been managing my money. I I pulled the plug and I have to say, folks thought that I, I was having a mental breakdown or anything or something because why do you leave a good job? And you leave a good job because if it is sucking your soul, it is no longer what works for you and energizes you. How powerful is it not only for you as an employee, but for your employer, future and current, if you're not doing, if you're not really your best self anymore, you should move on to something that will make you the best self again, right? And that's, that's where the term came from, was that gentleman I saw on my first day of work at that company. Wow. Yeah. So if we find ourselves in that predicament, how do we get ourselves out of it? Or how do we even notice that we're in that predicament? I'm pretty sure the guy probably didn't even notice that he looked the way that he looked to them. I think, I think that you, I think we deep down know, but we do something that is, uh, that, that is self-sabotaging. And that, that is that we take on obligations. We take on financial obligations, we take on personal obligations, we take on family obligations to remove the choice that we can have. So this gentleman had kids to take to get to the university, right? Probably upgraded the house every time he or his wife or both got a promotion. And so the more assets you have that you need to take care of, whether it's relationships, um, stuff, house, whatever, you are actively removing choice from your life. Because you feel like you don't have a choice. You're, because you've actively taken choice. You know what? I'm glad that you you know you brought that up, choice, because it's not just taking on financial obligations. Sometimes we take on emotional, you know, obligations of everybody else. You know, even though I'm the first generation college student, I'm also the oldest of all my sisters and brothers. Between my mom and dad, I have like 13 sisters and brothers. So when I went to school, it was all about let me show my brothers and sisters an example of what success looks like. Because growing up in the hood, right outside of Chicago. The, the best example was drug dealers and game makers. So let me show my sister and brother something different. And so that's what drove me, you know, to go to school and do my best. But what I had to realize is that I needed to take the focus off of them and put it on me. Because what I share a lot within my coaching sessions is my self-awareness journey and how I transition from living to survivor of sexual abuse. So if I was going to truly be successful, and show my brothers and sisters an authentic example of success that I needed to heal from that trauma. I needed to focus on Lakeisha, right, and do the work that was necessary to heal from that trauma. So financial obligations, emotional obligations, you know, these are the things that we take on, right, when we're, you know, these, you know, matriarchs, if you will, in the family. You know, and it just sometimes, you know, people put us on pedestals and we wondering how the heck we get all the way up here. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it, it can be hard sometimes. It can be emotionally challenging. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you for that. But, you know, let's move back towards, towards my just a little bit. We're going to change up the conversation just a little bit because, you know, Ryan, yeah. you had some really, really good success within your life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was articles done on you on how you was on track to have two point six yep. million dollars in retirement yeah. savings, yep. right? And you was on track to be generating two hundred eight thousand dollars a year by the time you was fifty five. You know, when like, you say it like this, it's very depressing. But. <laughs> no, no, no. That is that is awesome. Phenomenal. Yeah, that's phenomenal that you was on track like that. But you know, like most times, life happens, right? And it throws a wrench in our plans, financial plans, our goals, whatever the case might be, right? Yep. So tell us a little bit about your yeah, situation uh, and how you know, uh, it a lot of what uh, Elena just said is um, is is true. I mean, I yeah. lived that that like that keeping up with the Jones lifestyle. And uh, it was I lived like that for about 15 years of my life and it was um, tremendous wow. tremendous uh, financial pressures on me uh, pretty much daily. And it got to a point where I was just in this uh, circular financial merry-go-round. I, I described it a little bit on my website. I've got some posts to talk about it, but uh, it, it was very traumatic for me. And I got to a point in my life where I said, "You know what? I don't. I don't want to live like this anymore." Uh, and I made big changes. And uh, I sold my house. 
and I reprioritized everything in my life and I reduced my housing by 80%. Wow. And uh, I now save $30,000 a year towards my retirement. Wow. And That's so, so awesome. Yeah, yeah it, it's something I'm really proud of. And uh, since I've gone through this uh, transformation, you know, I can see things in my life uh, with such clarity. Yeah. It's just yeah. when all of that uh, financial debt and obligation is lifted from somebody's life, I mean, you've got the freedom to do whatever you want to do and you don't have to worry about day-to-day -day bills. So, you know, I go on vacations a lot with my kids and uh, we do a lot of family activities together. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's just, uh, it's really powerful stuff. It's very yeah, empowering. Yeah. So in order to get to that point, I, I think I hear what it is that you're saying, that you had to go beyond budgets, right? You had to There's really a lot of psychology in, in, involved. Uh, I had to come, you know, I had to be open to change and changing my mindset. Yes. That was key yeah. in all of this. And uh, I looked at these uh, solutions to my uh, expenses, my housing expenses, that were very much outside the box. I mean, not a lot of people would, you know, pull up stakes from uh, suburbia and go live in a condominium cooperative community. It just, uh, it's a very unconventional for a family to do that. But, you know, I did it and it worked out for me. And, uh, you know, I saved $30,000 a year now because of it. That's awesome. Yeah. I yeah. think, you know, thinking outside the box is crucial for every area of our life, not just with, you know, finances, with, you know, setting goals, you know, overcoming traumatic experiences and things like that. We have to embrace change for personal growth, yep. period. In my opinion, right? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Absolutely. How do you think self-awareness helps with the personal growth? Well, it definitely helps when you are trying to goal set and definitely trying to make the next um, change in your life or trying to stop habits that you are constantly going back into. Um, so for me, you know, I, you know, if we want to talk about yes. our spending habits, yes. I definitely feel like for me, Although I'm saving when I use coupons, I'm mm -hmm. still spending money. So I needed to, you know, stop trying to be counter um, productive there when I wanted to goal set and save a certain amount of money. But yet I'm just, you know, not saving money because the money's still being spent. So I think, you know, for me, it, it, it really requires admitting the things that I'm doing that are, are not beneficial to me and then planning out how I'm going to um, trace them and, and really um, move forward in a way that's going to reach to, to my end goals. And so um, that's how I've, I've seen self-awareness work for me and, and what I'm doing. I love that. Can you give us some psychology behind that? Can you give us some psychology behind that? Actually accepting what it is that we are doing that's causing the financial issues? Like why, why is it that we are so afraid to acknowledge our financial faults? The first step is, and you had an aha moment, that's what I call them aha moments, where we realize that our behavior is not only not serving us, but it's getting us further and further away from what we want. You had that aha moment with the shoes, because you said, here's this thing I want, and here's the thing, this thing I thought I want, but I probably wanted that buzz from buying the shoes. Yeah. That's yeah. certainly but I, for me it's cosmetics. <laughs> Psychologically, it is getting very clear about what it is that's making you unhappy. And it can be a situation, it can be a desire that right now you don't see the path to fulfill. And once you acknowledge that the behaviors that you have are not getting you to that thing that you want, then the question is, okay, well, what do I need to change? But if that acknowledgement doesn't happen up front, you're not going to change anything. If anything, you might self-medicate with another pair of pumps. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, or something else that's not pumps. It could be cosmetics. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, lipstick fixes everything. <laughs> I felt that way about shoes until I wanted to go over to Europe. <laughs> so, do you have any financial issues that you had? You know, um, I'm a traveler. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm such a traveler. Just, you know, even take for instance, just from. I want to say from May till as recent as August, I just went from to New York to Cabo to the whole time. So I feel like my biggest thing in is trying to remember, you know, I can travel, but I need to make sure that I'm not still 
buying things that I don't need to buy, yeah. you know, and just, you know, you know, I'm a member of Costco, so I'm always like bulk buying. Okay, so I need all that paper towels. Do I need all those toilet paper? So my biggest woes is traveling and and definitely not always trying to reach a new experience when I'm still having saving goals to, you know, right. get out of debt in a certain areas, such as like my car and everything like that. So, right. Right, right, right. But everything that we do, there's definitely some type of financial lesson mm -hmm. that we can learn. Okay, so for me, it's not Costco, it's Sam's Club. <laughs> I will buy that big old <laughs> palette of paper towels, even though it's just me and my husband. Right. But, you know, we make a sales fund once a year. So that's mm -hmm. money that we're saving. So we can definitely learn, you know, from different aspects of our life, you know, when it comes to finances. Brian had a really interesting way. Uh -huh. He learned his financial lessons. You did, was it 42 dates in 18 months? That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and you, and yeah. You, well, it, when you, you say it like that, it doesn't sound like <laughs> that. But when you space it out, it's like, you know, three a month or something. So, you know, do the math. It's okay. But, yeah. Tell um, us a financial lesson that you learned from You know, uh, yeah, when I was, uh, you know, dating a little bit more, um, you know, I, I went on a, a lot of dates with uh, people from various backgrounds of, yeah. um, of finances people just you know the full continuum of what people's experiences were growing up with finances and for me I mean you know that that at the time you know I didn't realize until the end that yeah that's that's pretty important something to yeah. to take notice of and uh, you know how that would play you know a role in the future when I'm with somebody um, but the key that I found out with the common theme was basically was to have good communication about it like you have to be able to talk to your partner uh, about the financial yeah. uh, matters in, in your relationship. Now, how do you do that before you get married, though? Like, do you bring that up on the first date, the second date? Do you bring up finances? Like, I mean, how do you... <laughs> you're right. Some were first dates. Uh, you know, some were more than first dates. But, and um, you talked about finances. You know, just it's just I think it falls in line with um, goals. And, you know, what, what, are, what are your goals in life? What do you, you know... How do you want your life to be, you yeah. know, 5, 10, 15 years from now? If I'm going to be with you, I mean, what, uh -huh. what do you think, you know, um, our life would be like? You know? I don't know. If I was on a date with a guy, he brought up finances on the first day. I bring up student loans. <laughs> do you really? You so, ask about student loans. I mean, sometimes I ask, oh, you know, do you, I, I mean, I'm like, oh, you I'm know. Like, what's your name? What do you do? How much do you have? I don't know if I do on the first date. I think I ask it within the first five. Just because I'm always curious. Just to go back to your comment yeah. about, you know, financially, how would we have to, how would our finances look in the future? Just because, you know, I think, you know, with student loans being such a big issue it and is. kind of a drawback from achieving, you know, American dream, how much you envision it to be, I think student loans is a good conversation to have. And, you know, just to see, you know, is there credit debt as well? And is there these other kind of debts? Just to yeah. kind of bring the conversation into an understanding of, like, I'm coming in this with this. Are you coming in something similar? So sometimes I like to add that in. Have you scared anybody else? I think one. One guy you kind of scared I off. think one. But I don't know if, 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 if that was, you know. The I reason think, why? I think I don't, I, I'm just, I don't know if I scare anyone out by um, asking student loans, I think I kind of taken them back by the question. By the question, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. What about you? Would, would you be comfortable? But now I just have to say, I, I never directly ask. Okay. Just student loans. Okay. I just skirt around <laughs> the question. <laughs> but they get, they, they get, get it. What it they is get it. Yes. What about you? Would you talk about finances like that on Thursday? That's pretty bold, I think. I mean, not saying that it's wrong. Well, I, I mean, you know, I didn't go down like a checklist right, or anything right. like that. I mean, exactly. sometimes these things just naturally came Come up. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, they, and I wasn't the one on uh, some of them to initiate it either. So, you know, it's, you know, somebody would show up for coffee or something and they were complaining about, you know, their credit card bill came or, you know, you can just pick up on these things. Okay. So. And build upon the conversation. Yeah. Build upon the conversation. <laughs> I told my husband about my student loans, but it wasn't the first five days. It was a while. We had been dating. You know, we had been dating for a while. Let me be honest, it was after he proposed. But that's okay. But, you know, I did tell him before we got married, technically. Because <laughs> student loans, like you said, are no joke. There are no joke. So, Aylin, you talk about the wisdom paradox on your website. I am really intrigued by that. Can you explain to us? what that is and how that affects our relationship with money? That, the, the wisdom paradox actually 
actually came across by accident because I, I went on a, a bit of a book bender and read over 300 books in a, in a few years. Wow. I, All financial books? Uh, a lot of financial, a lot, let's call it uh, non-fiction. Okay. So a variety of non-fiction books and just a sprinkle of fiction books in there um, okay. for good measure. And so as my understanding of various things grew, all it did, now it's, it's good, learning is always good, I'm yeah. never going to knock it, but yes. imagine it's a bubble. So, so this room maybe is all of the knowledge you can get in the universe, everything that's available. And then your knowledge over time as you experience things grows. Well, the outside of this bubble exposes you to more as it grows. It exposes you to more and more things where you say, I don't know. It is fantastic. And it does a few things. It makes you realize that there's so much to learn that you could never get bored if you just keep pursuing things that you're curious about. But it also makes you realize that everybody else also doesn't, doesn't know. know. But they might not just they, they, they might just not be aware of just how much they don't know. Right? Think of teenagers, that answers it all. Oh, right. <laughs> and and there's there's a there's freedom in that because you kind of come to terms <clears throat> with the fact that you can never know it all and that it's okay to live in the gray area where the world is not black and white. And it is it's a, it, it was such a powerful realization for me that I, I'm more laid back about the fact that I don't know it all, but I'm also excited to keep learning and I'm not worried about not knowing it all anymore. Whereas I think that when you're, when you're maybe early 20s, maybe even to early 30s, there's this pressure, this stress of knowing it all and, and, and it, it goes away, ironically, because you realize Increasingly, you just don't know anything. I mean, it's impossible for one person to know it all, and, and you can get comfortable with that the more things you learn about. Wow, you know, that's interesting. You know, for me, it's like I had a problem with not knowing it all or, or seeking answers and not being able to find them. Because law school is all about the gray areas. Would you would you agree? I agree. Where, but I am a black and white type of person. So because law school was all about the gray areas, I had a hard time, you know, with law school. Because I'm like, either it's yes or no, or it's, it's always maybe. Right. Depends. It's always a maybe. And so it wasn't until I started to accept that gray area that, you know, it was like the pressure of having to know it all. You know, just kind of went away and melted a little bit. And I think, you know, once I started to play in that gray area a little bit in my life, was also how I was able to become open to starting my business, this is true. Because, you know, life coaching and personal development, it's all about the gray areas. Because there is no right or wrong answer per se. You know, it's all about what's going on in that person's world and how they're in charge of it. You know, what are their experiences and what they're going through. And so, in order to really help someone out, I literally had to come up off of that being in the, you know, having to have a yes or no, you know, left or right type of answer in the planning right and, it, and it's tough because of social media now. Oh yes. It's it's as if it's so polarized. Oh, yes. It, things are black and white. You say no. There's nuances mm -hmm. in everything. Mm -hmm. In everything, and that's another reason why I share my story all the time about you know surviving sexual abuse, you know, to bring others, you know, forward to motivate others to come forward to get the help that they need, you know, and not just in that area, but whatever traumatic experience that you have gone through. I'm pretty sure you went through a traumatic experience with your finances, right? That was you know traumatic. It can be parents getting divorced when you were seven or eight years old. That's affecting how you live. Whatever that traumatic experience is, I share my story to motivate others to come forward to get the help that they need, you know, so they can chase purpose and not money and find fulfillment within their purpose, right? So, um, Arnade, would you give advice to other first-generation 
you know, college students who are watching right now, what advice would you give to them to pursue a career that they actually love as opposed to a career that's going to, you know, bring prestige to the family? So, I, you know, I, I really like what you're saying here. It's like, you know, we're going back to your example about um, being happy when you go to work. Um, and I think we should really stop, you know, if I'm, the advice I would say is definitely stop and think about what comes to your mind when you're happiest. Are you happiest when you are maybe being creative and an artist? Um, you know, are you happiest when you are reading up on history or reading up on something else that's not related? Because, you know, growing up in a Haitian household, since my parents are from Haiti, you know, we are only allowed to be doctors, engineers, or lawyers. And so, not that I don't enjoy being a lawyer, but I do enjoy the part about being creative in my life. You know, I, I really talk about how I was a great violin player, but I never got to really pursue the arts. You know, I talk about how now I discover that I, I enjoy art. So I think yeah. really at a young age when people, or if you're older and you really want to go back into your memory log and think about what made you so happy as a kid or as a teenager, really write it down and think about where you could go with that. Which positions or which professions or which areas of work really could target and really allow you to explore that because you have to be at work eight hours or more in a given day and you really want to be happy about sitting in a chair or getting up early. Like I get up every day at five, but I get up because I know that I'm going to be a mental health advocate. I'm going to go ahead and talk about the fact that there is trauma that exists in everyone's life and there's resources that people can connect it to and I'm feeling a bigger purpose than what is initially was planned for a typical lawyer, right? Yeah. And so I think it's really awesome. about knowing what really brings you joy and really seeing the various ways that it can be executed. I love that. And you know, what makes you happy doesn't have to be tied to your career either. Because right. you can very well be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer and do what makes you happy on the side. Exactly. Like playing that violin. Exactly. You know? Um, it takes self-awareness for us to really, you know, get to it, get to the root of what makes us mm -hmm. happy. So thank you for that. That's some really great advice. Awesome. You guys, thank you so much for this conversation. I really enjoyed you guys on today. You know, Brian, let's start with you. Tell us, where can we find you? Uh, you can go to BucksAndSense.com, Twitter, um, wherever. Okay. All over the internet. <laughs> all over the internet. Okay. <laughs> Lovely. So, First and Rise. Um, first spelled all the way, GN, Rise. And so I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, um, and on my website as well. And Free to Pursue, you can find that on uh, YouTube and on um, uh, a blog, obviously, freetopursue.com. <laughs> and I'm also on Twitter, but Free to Pursue is taken. So you can find me at Free Pursue. Free Pursue. Okay, okay. freepursue.com. Uh, yes, for the for the blog. Yeah. For the blog, okay. I'll make sure to have everybody's contact information where you can follow them in the show notes. But you guys, thank you so much for joining me on today. I really enjoyed you guys. I hope you guys, you know, pull something away from this conversation as much as I did. I'm always learning from my guests and the gems you guys dropped today. I know I'm definitely gonna use them as I finish out the rest of my FinCon experience and go off in life as well.